These words from Isaiah are eternally powerful, especially when we recall what was happening in Israel when they were written. The stump of Jesse in this text refers to the land and to the people of Israel who have been reduced to living without hope. The political situation in that nation has left the people in total disarray and without hope for their world. But just when things are at their worst, God promises, God makes a promise, that out of this terrible situation, something good will happen. Isaiah proclaims that God will send a leader who will rule with a sense of justice and with mercy towards everyone, but especially towards those who are most vulnerable. The littlest ones, the ones who are ignored, the innocent ones in our society will be protected, held, and cared for by God. Isaiah urges the people to remember, to remember that they are children of God and that their hope lies in nothing less than God's desire for righteousness and peace. This promise was simply unbelievable to the people as they heard it. It flew in the face of everything they knew, and it flew in the face of how they were living. But the rules of life, Isaiah says, are about to change. Promises will bend in the direction towards gentleness and peace. <clears throat> Shalom. The ever-faithful <clears throat> New Testament theologian Walter Brueggemann writes, Shalom is when creation eases up on hostility and destruction and finds another way of relating. Things will go back to the way they're supposed to be, the way they were meant to be, the way they were created to be. The Shalom vision of Isaiah is about bringing the impossible possibility into the world of a new creation. It will be a time of such power and transformation that the big ones will no longer eat the little ones and the world will be safe again for the small, the vulnerable, and the most helpless. In such a changed world, there will be plenty, plenty for everyone. And nature itself, declares Isaiah, will be transformed so that everything has a chance to be fully alive. Well, we read this text through Advent, throughout Advent, because it reminds us that we must simply wait, simply wait. But that also in the midst of our waiting, we begin to get clear that we wait not passively, but actively. We wait with hope. Our waiting is not simple in this sense. It's shot through with the intangible nature of what it means to be of hope. Simply put, hope is holding on to the quiet but deep certainty that God makes good the promises of God. Abraham and Sarah had hope. Mary had hope. Jesus had hope. And stories of hope are everywhere. I look out in the congregation this morning and I can say it with conviction. Stories of hope are everywhere. Some are nameless. Some are hidden deep within the regions of our souls and spirits. But I believe that the stories of hope are what keeps us coming to church. I believe that stories of hope help us to become believers. And I believe that it is stories of hope, each person holding stories of hope, that help us to remain less than cynical about our world. Well, as many of you know, and as guests this morning are about to hear, I've just returned from a trip to the many islands of Indonesia, where I joined about a dozen others in a mission trip uh, that brought all of us as members of Church World Service 
to some sites in Indonesia throughout the country. We visited four islands on our trip. There are 17,000 islands. Did you know that? I thought four was overwhelming. I can't imagine what it would be like to visit all 17,000. These islands that we visited brought us to some of the most remote parts of the country. And as I think about it, as I reflect back, um, being home now safe, dry, and sound, wherever we went, it seems that the trip involved at least two airplane rides, several vans, a horde of taxis, and sturdy shoes. We went out in all of these various modes of travel, but also we traveled by foot, and that was some of the most exciting and difficult part of our journey. After a few days getting ourselves acquainted with Indonesia in the city of Jakarta, we flew, this time in two planes, to West Timor, West Timor, where we visited folks who lived a long way outside of a remote town. Did I say lived a long way outside of a remote town? It was a long way out. We drove together in taxis down a dirt road, and as we drove, it began to rain. First, just those nice scattered drops on the window, and then those big drops that shook the car and made the roads almost impossible to drive upon. Soe, the city that we were visiting and the region that we are visiting, is normally very dry. 11 months of the year, Soe is dry. The rainy season is November. And I happened to be traveling there in November. Finally, we reached our destination. And as we piled out of our cars, shaken and tired and a little weary, there was still a ways to go. On foot, we needed to make our way down a gully into a hut where our meeting would be. By the time we reached the hut, there was so much mud on my shoes. I wore my good Merrill sandals that day, and they happened to be open-toed. There was so much mud on my shoes, I could hardly lift my feet out of the mud to take another step. And being the good Dutch cleanser that I am, I was worried about bringing all of that mud into the hut where we would be visiting. Not to worry. The hut had only a dirt floor, and so we wouldn't be messing up the fine white carpeting. This tiny, out-of-the-way community had recently received a spring well from Church World Service. For all the years of that community, forever, they had used only water that had been received from the moisture and the rain of the jungle. And remember, it rains one month a year. As that community grew, and all communities grow with more and more children over the years, the demands for clean water increased, and this tiny band of folks had become more and more desperate. Church World Service, all of us, helped to find a spring in the woods and dug a deep well. Now there is plenty of water, water pouring out into the entire community. Well, you might have thought we were President Obama himself come back to Indonesia to greet his people. As we entered this little hut, everyone was gathered and they were all in their best. There was giggling and laughing and ooing and eyeing, and I have to tell you this, it was reported to me later that it was probably the first time that anyone had seen a tall, white-haired, white woman. And there were several photo occasions that I missed, but I guess people were hiding behind posts and looking out and taking our pictures and then showing them to their friends and laughing. <laughs> anyway, there were mothers just behind a curtain holding babies, and there were children scattering around, so happy, so excited to see us. And the leaders of the village, the men, were in their very best clothes, woven fabrics, tied as skirts around their waists. We were invited to sit on bare wooden benches, and as we looked up, there was one bulb of light 
hanging from the ceiling, one little blip of electricity, and the rain continued to pelt around the hut. Then it happened. I saw what happens when people are given hope, when dreams are fulfilled and lives come alive. A bamboo tray came out, and on the tray were piles of beautiful hand-woven fabric, gorgeous colors and weavings, scarves of such color and beauty and vibrancy of life. They were awesome. And the rainy hut then was transformed into living color. And as each one of us stood, the members of the tribe looked around and picked a scarf and carefully laid a scarf around the necks of each one of us, presenting them to us and then bowing and giving us this prayer of thanks. Once there was very little hope for this out-of-the-way place on a far-flung island in the middle of the Banda Sea. No one really cared about these folks, and no one thought they had or might need caring at all. Can you imagine what that well has done for them? First off, they can remain in their own town, in their own village, in their own place. And children now will grow up there and perhaps remain and they will have safe water and clean clothes and a bath every once in a while. Hygiene has changed, health has improved, babies are living, and the greening of life has begun. I will be forever grateful to remember and to learn again that out of hope, when people feel and understand and realize hope in their lives, a wellspring of generosity and graciousness arises. Those scarves were handmade by people in thanksgiving for the living hope that they had received. I represented not just myself, not just you, but all the folks who contribute and who care about the rest of the world. And I'm so glad this morning to place Sam's scarf because it was red. Sam's scarf, the scarf that he received, my husband, on the Advent table. I invite you to come up after worship and take a look, hand-woven. Hope is the certainty that God will make good on God's promises of life. I would be remiss this morning if I didn't speak to you about Nelson Mandela and about my experience of him and my love for him. Hope is a certainty that God will make good on God's promises for life. Nelson Mandela's life was made out of hope. Do you remember that he was jailed in 1962 on Robben Island? How many of you have been born since 1962? Can you imagine? He was imprisoned for 27 years and continued to be hopeful about his own life and the coming of justice and reconciliation to South Africa. During those years, I lived in New York City in the 80s and I joined with millions of those who worked on economic sanctions and protest against apartheid in South Africa. I became very involved in that work and I even went to jail in those years in Washington, D.C. I went to jail for 20 hours. We had a group that protested on the, and we knew we would be arrested, a group that protested on the driveway of the White House. And sure enough, after we had been there three or four hours, they did come arrest us and take us away. I spent 20 hours in jail, 20 hours in jail. It was not pleasant, kind, or even easy for those few hours. What kept Nelson Mandela alive and whole all those years? Those who were imprisoned with him said that he was a most unusual prisoner. The guards said the same thing. He kept up in those 27 years a strong regimen of exercise, sleep, 
reading, and work. He never let prison take away his self-respect and his dignity as a human being. I'm told that he even ironed his own prison clothes, showing up always in pressed pants when others simply let themselves go and forgot about it. In other words, he never brought into himself the system of evil and the hostility around him, but consistently and patiently held on to hope. He found another way to live, a shalom way of living, never letting go of the possibility, not only of his own release, but of a free, blossoming South Africa. Out of the stump of prison comes the blossom of Jesse. The world loves him and mourns him for so many things. For his smile and his sense of humor, his quiet intelligence and the way he inspires all of us to live bigger, larger, more hopeful lives. The world loves him because he was the first black president of South Africa. But he infects our faith and he infects our lives at another place, a deeper place, a place, I believe, where faithful people long to live. He never, never gave in to despair. And somehow he managed to live in hope through the most hopeless, the most dire, the most difficult of situations. In this struggle, I believe that God was surely alive in him and was with him. In this season of Advent, we are being encouraged to simply wait. In this season of cold and darkness, we are encouraged to turn always toward the light. Stories of waiting, stories of Advent are all around us. From the people of Soe in West Timor, I learn that waiting involves turning towards generosity and joy. That is a response to hope. From Madiba, I remember that hope is a gift of God and that it involves steady discipline, trust, and a hopeful spirit that all human beings deserve to live in peace, deserve to live with hope, deserve to have a chance at reconciliation and righteousness in their nations and in their country. May it be so. May it be so. And may God fill you in this Advent with joy, hope, and peace in believing so that you, my beloved friends, may always be involved in the greening of hope. Amen.